Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Out of thankfulness to God for giving us his word, at the end of the reading, I'll conclude by saying, this is the word of the Lord, and invite you all to respond together. Thanks be to God. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. This is the word of the Lord. At this time, Kingdom Kids are now dismissed. Good morning, family. Good morning. My name is Deshaun, and I have the privilege of serving here as the classes director at the King's Church, and today I get the privilege of sharing God's word with you and being the first one to get to preach since Bishop Thomas returned from the mountaintop <laughs> with the word to bring to us. <laughs> so I get to give him a little bit of break today. So election years present a unique opportunity to discuss how to disagree. I had to fulfill my mention quota of the election as one to get it out pretty quickly, but I'm also serious at the same time that it does in these seasons reveal to us how we deal with confrontation and how we deal with disagreement. And so are we the contentious type that just stays ready for a debate and a fight and no matter the significance of the discussion, they are ready to argue? Or do we find ourselves as more of the timid type that just doesn't want any disagreement, just wants to get along and wants to just be well-received? Or do we find ourselves more in that indifferent camp that just wants to be left alone? And so no, today I'm not focusing in on politics, but something far more significant, and that is, what do we do with false gospels? And this matter for today is of great significance because and how we respond is not just matters of opinion, difference of thought, a different strategy, but it has eternal significance. So let me impress this upon you a little bit more through your imagination with this thought experiment. And so imagine with me for a moment that Jesus is at the back of the room and that you're here on the stage and then everything in between disappears. And all that remains is a pit that is endless. Fire is lifting. And you are here, Christ, 
is there. And then imagine somebody comes to you and says, hey, the way to get across is, hey, Jesus will make up 25%, maybe 50, maybe even 75%. But what you need to do is to build a bridge in midair with straw to get across. Or even imagine if they said, hey, Jesus will get you started on the way, but you need to finish the journey to get to the back. And so as we think about that, I would say that counsel, no matter how well-meaning, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how sweet the tone is, is utterly stupid and should not be regarded at all. And I use strong language like that because what I want to impress upon us today is that even in that scenario, the the scriptures paint a much worse position that we're in. Is that that chasm is not just the length of this room, but it is vast, insurmountable, and also we are dead in our sins. And so in that moment, using straw, To build a bridge in midair is utter folly and stupidity, and it should be regarded as such because our only hope in that moment is that Christ reaches us the whole way. And so upon that, as we're going to lock in today, and our main point is this, we must resist false gospels because of our submission to Christ and love for our neighbors. So let me say this again. We must resist false gospels because of our submission to Christ and our love for our neighbor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us this morning. And Lord, in such a time as this, where the conversation and topic of disagreement and how do we get along at the top of a lot of our minds. So, Lord, there's many ways that we respond, but what we pray for today, Lord, is that though we can disagree about many different things, but when it comes to the truth of your gospel, Lord, help us to stand firm. And for those of us, Lord, who are timid and afraid to speak up, Lord, I pray that you may strengthen our spines. Firm up our feet so that when the moment comes, Lord, we speak the truth. We say of there really is only one way and every other way that tries to prop itself up is utter folly. And so, Lord, help us in this moment to trust you and to recognize not only for our own benefit, Lord, but also for those who would hear the gospel proclaimed, those who would come after us, Lord. Help us not to just consider ourselves today, but also your people who are near and far. So we thank you for this moment. We pray that your spirit may strengthen us to receive your word and to live it out in the way that you have called us to. It's in your name that I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So today we pick up in Galatians chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 10. And so if you haven't been here, this is week 3 of our study of the book of Galatians. And so in week one, Pastor Ian led us through the first nine verses and established this, that we must hold fast to the gospel of Christ who alone secures grace and peace for us. Look how Paul says in verse six and seven in Galatians one. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who would trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so there are those who are coming to attack, and not just, again, mere opinion, but they're wanting to remove and sever them from Christ. And then in week two, as we saw some of Paul's testimony, he finished it off in the last six verses, starting in verse 18, and said this. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith 
he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. And so we pick up now in chapter 2, where Paul is continuing on of recounting what happened around this season. And he begins verse 1 by saying this. He says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. And so 14 years have passed, and Paul is making his way back to Jerusalem. And in all these years, Paul has only spent about 15 days with some of the apostles. And this detail is for us because Paul's making the point firmly clear that he was not mentored, tutored, trained, commissioned by the apostles. And so Paul's understanding of the gospel did not come from sitting under them, but rather it came directly as a revelation from Christ. And so what this does is it furthers Paul's point that he wasn't a rogue disciple who was corrupting their teaching and needed to be sent back to go get corrected and get shored up on his theology. But rather, Christ had called Paul as their equal and authority to go primarily to the Gentiles, though the rest of the apostles would remain with the Jews. And so Paul goes up after 14 years to Jerusalem, and he brings, brings Titus and Barnabas with him. And then verse 2 tells us why he brought them. He says, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. And so though we don't know the exact revelation, it's probably either Acts chapter 11 or between somewhere there and 15, but we don't know the exact one of it, but the point is made here by John Calvin as he succinctly says this. He says, because God had directed the journey that was intended to confirm Paul's teaching, that, con that teaching was confirmed not only by human agreement, but also by divine authority. And so the point here is that Paul went up not on his own mission, by his own purposes, but it was God was the one who sent him. And what a glorious thing that God reveals himself to us. He tells us what he requires of us. He tells us of himself. He chooses to reveal himself because if he did not, quite frankly, he would remain concealed from us. What a great thing that God does choose to reveal himself, and what greater revelation do we have of our God but in his word. We can gain clarity of who he is. We can know what he desires. We can know the plan of salvation in his word. And so what Paul demonstrates here for us is a principle, that his submission to Christ led him to obey his revelation. So Paul, again, he demonstrates this to us that his submission to Christ, his fidelity to Christ, led him to obey his revelation. And though you and I may not get a voice from heaven or a gift from a prophet, we do have his word that is filled with the richness of his revelation. And so the disposition of his people is obedience to God's revealed word. And just an encouragement, Peter even tells us this in 2 Peter 1, 17 through 21. He says, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so if we want to know what does God desire, who is he, we can trust his word because it was God who gave it to us. And so Paul goes up because of this revelation. And it says he set a couple things before them in verse 2. 
So it says he set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. And so Paul relays before them the reality of what he was preaching and who he was preaching to. And this is a problem for the Judaizers because they had a problem with the reality of Paul saying that God freely forgives sinners. And then also that Gentiles did not need to become Jewish. And so the weight of the matter, the crux of the situation is at this point. And so if they would have resisted, if they would have denied either of these two, two truths, there would have been a split within the church. And so we see here that Paul was not going up to stir up strife, but to protect the truth of the gospel from those trying to corrupt it and those who would listen to them. And so Paul makes this clear when he says in the back end of verse 2, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. And so Paul was not worried that the gospel and his calling were true, but that the false teachers sought to undermine his work. Look how John Stott explains this point. He says, It was not we, we may be sure, that he had any personal doubts or misgivings about his gospel and needed the reassurance of the other Jerusalem apostles. For he had been preaching it for 14 years, but rather, lest his ministry, past and present, should be rendered fruitless by the Judaizers, it was to overthrow their influence, not to strengthen his own conviction, that he laud his gospel before the Jerusalem apostles. And then Douglas Moo adds this to it by saying, his fear is not that his gospel will be voided of its power if the decision in Jerusalem should go against him. What he fears, rather, is that a negative verdict will create a fissure in the church between his Jewish and Gentile wings. And so we live in the success of this moment, so it can be hard to feel the weight of it. It's like when you read in your history textbooks of whatever monumental meeting that if it went a different way, the trajectory of that nation or all of the world would have been completely different. And when we live in the success of that moment, it's hard to grasp and to consider and to feel the weight of this situation. And the reality is we know what it feels like even in this present moment of meetings or elections or decisions that are to be made that we feel the weight of what will happen if it goes this way or that way. And our future generations will not know the weight of what we feel in this moment. And so that is what's happening in this situation is that if the decision was different, it would have created a fissure in the church. But through it all, I want you to see Things are never really truly up in the air, as we may say, but rather that God is ordaining and moving things so that his purposes are being accomplished. Therefore, we can take our cues from Paul that we should submit to God's communication in his word, even if we don't understand how it's all going to work out. And so because we don't know how it's all going to work out, we trust him, we rest in him, we submit to his word. And so we begin here. If we are to resist false gospels, it first comes with submitting ourselves to Christ. It begins there because in the end, there will be moments when that submission, that fidelity is tested and the consequences don't only impact us. So we must be unyielding in a particular kind of confrontation. And that's what we're going to see in these next three verses in verses 3 through 5. So it says this, starting in verse 3, as Paul breaks from what he's speaking about, he says, But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So we see now why Paul bought, brought Titus with him. Titus was a living testimony of a Gentile coming to believe in Christ. And so Titus was confirmation that the gospel did go freely, but also to the Gentiles. And so this conclusion is even in line if you spent time with us in the book of Acts. In Acts 15, verses 10 and 11, when Peter makes this declaration, he says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples? 
that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So this is the proclamation that Peter makes when the Judaizers are coming in saying they must adhere to the law of Moses and they must be circumcised. And Peter recognized we couldn't even bear that. It's only through Christ that any of us will be saved. It is the same for us all. And I won't belabor this point because we're going to get into it later into Galatians. But Paul's problem was not circumcision or the law of Moses within themselves. The problem was the wrong use of them as a means by which anyone can make themselves righteous before God. The law was always meant to be a guide. It was never meant to be a bride. And that is where Paul drew the line when the law or anything else, anything else, was taken from its proper place and elevated to the place of Christ, and we should draw that same line too. And so... Anything or anyone that tries to add or take away from Jesus being entirely sufficient to save us from our sins must be utterly resisted as we see Paul do here in this next section. So in verse 4 he says this, Yet because a false brother secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. I secretly means they entered in by deception, passing themselves off as brothers when they were truly enemies. By slipped in, he means that they came in humbly, so their disposition was such that it was unassuming. This is a sobering reminder for us that until the Lord returns, the church will always have sinners and saints. Those who believe in the Lord and those who are opposed to him will always be mixed in within the church. What's even more sobering about what is happening here is that often those who lead people astray are actually really well-intentioned, good meaning. They think it's actually best for that person. And often we think of ideas of pure evil, but the reality is that often it's a corruption of good things. And so even the worst of false teachers, the worst of false gospels, there's something snuck in there of, hey, this is actually best for you. And so because of this deception, which is often veiled in well-meaning, understanding tones, looking out for our best interests, we must know where we stand so that we know when somebody is trying to lead us astray. Look how Robert Allen Cole says it about this. He says, Such people were no doubt genuinely shocked by the carefree attitude of the Gentile Christians to the law of Moses, their own most treasured possession. It is highly likely that they thought themselves to be enriching the spiritual lives of Gentile converts immeasurably. But from his own experience, Paul knew that this action was but a return to slavery. True, the Galatians had not been slaves to this particular Jewish system before as pagans. They had their own system of religion and morals, but a change of masters is not an escape from slavery. That is Paul's whole point. So they tried to send Paul, and Paul said he's not going back. Paul said, you must be crazy. I have worked that out. I've done that, and it just leads to despair. And so you want me to abandon Christ? He is the only one fit for this. He is the only one that truly can save. And so you want me to abandon him. You must be out of your mind. And so Paul, in verse, gets to the heart of this passage. And I wouldn't even say his approach towards Galatians in verse 5 in response to these false teachers and their teaching. And it says this in verse 5. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul recognizes the deception and where this is going even though they were false brothers brought in cunningly. He knows that this only leads to despair and hopelessness. And so in this we also should not yield to anyone trying to lead us astray. And so then the question comes, why are we still led astray? 
Why are we still led astray in the first place? Why do false teachings just seem to grip us and take us in away from Christ? And so I have three reasons why I believe we are vulnerable to following false teachings. And these definitely can overlap and they're not exhaustive, but I think there are helpful categories for us to think through. The first one is ignorance, the second one is idolatry, and the third one is indifference. Let's begin with that ignorance. Colossians 2.8 says to us to see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. And so Colossians warns us not to be taken captive. That means to be taken in by these false teachings. And so... At times we are led astray by these false teachings because we simply do not trust the truth. And what I mean by that is our problem, honestly, today with ignorance is less of a lack of information, but rather we are drowning in it. So with the omnipresence of the internet, there's no lack of opinions on anything and everything. Google has often become our greatest teacher instead of sustained time studying and meditating on God's word. And so due to this, we are taken captive. If someone comes along and they can speak well and they know what they're saying into these false teachings because we have not trusted the truth ourselves. The second one is that we can be led astray by idolatry. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And look what he says, and I think this is fitting for our time. He says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. A church history professor would say, and he would do it tongue in cheek, but as we were walking through and just seeing all the different heretics throughout history and even modernly, he said his first question that he would ask is, who are they sleeping with? That would be the first question that he would ask when he saw this and I know we laugh, and it's like, oh, that's a little bit funny of, is, but is that true? And I can tell you to it, as we walk through it, you can see time and time again that people were led astray into false teaching, became false teachers because they had some idol, whether it was something sexual, whether it was something of greed, whether it was something of power, but time and time again, they had something they already desired, and they looked for something to appease and to validate what they already wanted to do. And so as Paul asserts here in 2 Timothy and confirmed through the experience of my professor and many of us have seen that often we are led astray into false teaching because of the idol in our heart. And we're looking for somebody to say, peace, peace, when there actually is no peace and to justify and appease our conscience and our sin. And then lastly... I believe we're led astray or vulnerable to false teaching because of indifference. And I believe this is the most insidious of the three. Because it's the one that we most easily justify and portrays ourselves as above the fray. And so due to the busyness of life, that feeling that we have enough problems of our own or just the weariness of saying the same thing, we are given over to an indifference that says, does it really matter? Does it really matter if this person is preaching or teaching or saying this, all kinds of things about the Lord and this false gospels, as long as I believe the right thing? Does it really matter if I need to say anything about it? Because I am well acquainted with this person of knowing that struggle, that temptation, there's a deception in it. Because it portrays us as we're above the fray, we're well-mannered, we're put together. We don't have to worry about all these different things, but the reality is indifference towards false gospels is not indifference towards everything. We do have something that we actually do care about and we would go to bat for, and so this is the deceptive nature of this indifference. And so as you consider whatever that looks like for you, 
in this indifference towards this false gospel, there is something that is saying, I will defend this. So, a couple of weeks ago, Bree and I celebrated our ninth anniversary. <laughs> yes, nine years, yeah. <laughs> I guess the applause. <laughs> so, if you don't know my wife, she is a wonderful woman who brightens up the room when she walks in. Yes, yeah, they appreciate it. She's funny. She's deeply empathetic. She's the person that you want to go to if you want to laugh and if you want to cry, if you need somebody to encourage you or if you need all three at once. So with that being said, I love this woman deeply. And if any man were to try to take her from me by trying to seduce her or encourage her to leave me or harm her physically, let's just say that there is no reservation in my protection for my wife. So as I say that, it feels obvious, right? It feels like, duh, you, any good husband will say that they're going to protect their wife. And this doesn't mean that every single moment I'm thinking through what to do or how to fight or whatever it may be, but there's just a steady disposition of I'm devoted to her, therefore anything that would harm her must be resisted. But what if I said I really love her, but... If any guy wanted to have his stab at her, if he wanted to have her, have your way. Or somebody's just tagging her with punches. And my thought is, as long as they don't come and mess with me, she can figure it out. (laughs) My hope is that as you hear that, the thought of me doing that, you are disgusted with that reality. That that visceral reaction that even me being a flawed, sinful man who falls short of the glory of God should step up and defend his wife. How much more so Christ? (laughs) When Christ wants to give a tangible example of his relationship to the church, Paul points us to marriage as an illustration of that relationship in Ephesians 5.32. So one of the very purposes of the creation of marriage is so that when Christ came and established his church, he would point to marriage and say, he is the perfect version of that. He is the perfect husband who seeks both the flourishing and protection of his bride. And so if Christ has this disposition towards his bride, the church, and we are united to him, then indifference should not be what describes the people of God towards false teachers seeking to cut off Christ from his people or hindering others to become a part of his people. We're continuing to drill down at the heart of this issue for today. Any false gospel, again, is not a different strategy. It's not mere semantics. It's not just a matter of opinions, but rather it is an effort to separate us from Christ. And so we draw a hard, fast line regarding any false gospel. It must be unreservedly resisted because of our devotion to Christ. And so Martin Luther sums this up really well, and he says this. Let this then... Be the, let this be then the conclusion of all together, that we will suffer our goods to be taken away, our name, our life, and all that we have. But the gospel, our faith, Jesus Christ, we will never suffer to be wrested from us. That means to be taken away by force. And cursed be that humility which here abaseth and submitteth itself. What Luther is attacking is this false humility that says, aren't we just supposed to all get along? Shouldn't we just have difference of opinions? It's your view, my view, who cares which way? But he is saying, particularly when it comes to this, not in every single matter, but particularly when it comes to false gospels, there should not be that quote unquote type of humility, but rather there should be an unreserved resistance because of our devotion to Christ. And so, This reason for Paul resisting, as he says here, is not even primarily for himself, but for the good of others. Look back with me in verse 5. He says that we did not yield in submission for even for a moment, and he tells us the reason. So that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul recognized 
that the means by which the gospel continues to go forth was through the people of God not playing with poison. And what a beautiful thing that we get to stand firm, not only for our own benefit, but particularly for the good of others. And we can appreciate this because there's a long list of people who have stood firm for the sake of the gospel, and quite honestly, we would never know their names. They've lost friends, family, sleep, and so much more so that the truth of the gospel was preserved for us to this day. And so, yes, God does use the big names, the major teachers that we are all familiar with, but overwhelmingly, it is the Holy Spirit produced fidelity of men and women who we will never know stood firm on the gospel, unyielding to false gospels, and we are eternally blessed because of it. And so now, by God's grace, we get to be a part of this long and beautiful lineage of the church who hitches their wagon to Christ and says, no other, and therefore, because of this, the Lord uses this so that even as we sit here today, that we get to hear the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ preserved for us and Lord willing, for those who will come after. And so Paul now finishes up the rest of this section by returning back to where he began of this meeting with those who seemed influential. And in usual Pauline fashion, verses 6 through 10 are actually just one sentence. So Paul has a lot to pack in and to say in this, but he establishes something else as we consider this resisting of false teachers, that he is also impartial to the commendation or the confirmation from the apostles. So in verse 6, we pick up, and he says, And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. So what I want you to take away from this last section is that Paul welcomes the affirmation, but he does not crave it. He's not dependent upon it. He does not need it. He says, they did not add anything to me. And again, Paul has been going through great lengths through this epistle to assert his apostleship coming from Christ, not to create another lane for himself, but rather to confirm that it truly was from God. So the apostles were the foundation of the church. They were men to be honored, but at the end of the day, they were still men. So Paul grounds this in the statement that God shows no partiality, which basically means that God does not look upon any human because of something of their own merit and say, I will show them favoritism. So Paul says God shows no one partiality, and therefore the apostles did not add something to Paul's call because it was confirmed from God. And then he continues on in verses 7 and 8, and he says, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been trusted with the gospel to the circumcised, and he continues in verse 8, he says, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And so Peter and Paul were not preaching two different gospels, no matter how much the false teachers rose up and said that they were preaching two different ones. Like how John says, John Stott says this, he says, their game, we might say, was not robbing Peter to pay Paul, but exalting Peter to spite Paul. <laughs> and this kind of thing even happens to this very day where Paul is pitted against the other apostles or even Christ himself that some would say, Paul has a different message, a different gospel. But as Paul puts forth here, the difference between him and Peter was not a matter of the gospel. It was a matter of emphasis and mission that they were called to. It's what we would call contextualization, is the difference between these two. And what that word basically means, and Doug Logan says this, he says, it's the utilizing the community's character and cultural cues to present ancient biblical texts in a modern context. And so what that is meaning is our approach, the way that we begin will look different dependent upon our audience, but the end is the same. It all ends at Christ. And so we apply this to our day when we speak in a particular language, when we have particular emphasis. And so for example, if I'm speaking to someone who's of the Muslim faith and also to an atheist, my starting point is not the same, but the end is 
that at the end of the day, Jesus is Lord, and that is good news because of the type of Lord that he is. And so however we may start, whatever strategy, whatever it may be, the gospel is still the same. All roads lead back to Christ. And this is what Paul's asserting here when he says he received it just as Peter did, and it was also the same Lord working in both of them to accomplish his purposes in different settings. And so praise God. And in this moment, that the apostles did not side with the Judaizers, but they land and side with Christ as we finish up in the last two verses. It says this in verse 9. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So the apostles model the other side of this, that they were impartial towards this confirmation of Paul, not seeking because Paul was doing well and they liked him better than the Judaizers, but rather, look what it says here. They perceive the grace that was given to Paul. They were following Jesus as he built his church. They did not create Paul's apostleship, but rather just said amen to what God was already doing through him. They saw the fruit of his ministry, that Gentiles were coming to Christ, and they saw Paul, who once tried to destroy the faith, was now proclaiming and building it up. And so they saw what God is doing, and they got behind it. And as we conclude, they asked him to remember the poor. And this is one of the great joys of displaying the gospel, that you and I, and even in this present moment, some still are, who are alienated far off from God can be brought near to Christ, but also to be brought into a family. And so because of what Christ has done in his death and resurrection, we get to enjoy this family fellowship. And as Paul says, it is not just in standing firm, but it is also in providing for one another. And so we get to do all of these things to the glory of Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, that though there may be times where we need to stand firm, we thank you, Lord, that it is you are the one who energizes and stabilizes us in that firmness. And so, Lord, this morning, as we sit here today, as we have encountered moments where we remain silent by those who would propagate false gospels, spoke loudly, Lord, forgive us. And Lord, help us in those moments that out of our devotion and love for you, that we speak up not just for our own sake. May we not just be self-seeking, but help us, Lord, to think and care for others who are presently hearing those false teachings or those who are being opposed to even meet you and to come to know you through the only one true gospel. And so, Lord, we ask all of these things because as we see in your word and we know by experience, you care about this far more than we do. And so, Lord, we pray, pray that you may bless this effort, pray that you may bless our hearing of your word and that we may leave out of here changed because of our love and devotion to you. It's in your name that I pray.